Hi everybody, how are we doing tonight? Thank you for coming out. Now tonight's conversation is about the idea of writing and one of the greatest challenges to writing today, which is censorship. Um, book bans are on the rise. The American Library Association has started a program that we are a partner in, which is called United Against Book Bans. As most of you probably saw in the news yesterday, Illinois has become the first state to outlaw book banning. Um, so that is a good thing. Um, and so we thought tonight what would be fun would be to talk to two very established writers about some of the dangers of censorship and how that affects them as writers. And so to do that, we have um, two wonderful guests. Joanne Liedema Ackerman is a novelist, short story writer, and journalist. Her works of fiction include The Dark Path to the River and No Marble Angels, and her newest novel, Burning Existence, just came out. Um, she has published uh, Pen Journeys, a memoir of literature and uh, uh, literature on the line, and was the editor for The Journey of Liu, Liu Xiaoboa, Liu Xiaoboa uh, from Dark Horse to Nobel Laureate. Um, she is the former international secretary of Penn International. She is a vice president of Penn International currently, and a former board and former member and former vice president of Penn America. She is also a trustee of the American Writers Museum, and we are extremely grateful for that. And as our extra special guest tonight, hailed by P.D. James as the most remarkable of modern crime writers, Sarah Paretsky is a friend of the American Writers Museum. She is also a New York Times bestselling author of more than two dozen novels, including the renowned V.I. Warshawski series. Um, she is one of only four living writers to have received both the Grand Master Award from the Mystery Writers of America and the Cartier Diamond Dagger from the Crime Writers Association of Great Britain. In 1986, she created Sisters in Crime, a worldwide organization um, for women crime writers, which earned her Miss Magazine's 1987 Woman of the Year Award. Sarah is also an essayist and editor, and her nonfiction book, Writing in an Age of Silence, attacked the topic of repression of free speech a number of years ago, and it remains unfortunately relevant still today. So I'd like you to help me in welcoming Joanne Lita Ackerman and Sarah Paretsky. We thought that I, I would start because my, my focus has been very um, international and global and Sarah has all the data, the specifics and knows very well the national and the local censorship. So um, I'm, um, I moved to London in 1990 with my two children and it was a great optimistic time. The Berlin Wall had fallen, the Soviet Union was breaking apart, everybody was turning towards democracy. And so many countries and so many, so many of those aspiring towards democracies and freedom were looking to America as their model. If you step back a little bit, in 1948, um, the US, Eleanor Roosevelt in particular, was very instrumental in getting past a universal declaration of human rights. The idea was that individuals, no matter what your politics, where you were, there are certain universal rights that individuals have and should have and should be protected and the United Nations was formed around that. And many people, many countries, surprising like China and Turkey, signed on to this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And out of it, the whole human rights movement is sort of based. Now, when I moved to London, I had just been president of one of the Penn Centers. At the time, we had two in the United States, and one was in Los Angeles, and one was in New York. But Penn was headquartered in London. And so I'd like to just take one sentence to explain what Penn is, for those who don't know stands for poets, essayists, and novelists. And after World War I, the writers, in, particularly in England, but then in France and the European countries, thought if we can get together, the writers, those that are the idea formers, um, we can perhaps tap down the nationalism that brought on World War I. And so they began forming clubs. And very quickly, the idea spread throughout Europe to America and other places. But it didn't take long to realize that one of the important elements of being a writer is the freedom to write. And as writers were getting arrested as um, the world is moving slowly to World War II, one of Penn's missions was to also stand there for, for the freedom of writers around the world. So today, Penn has over 150 centers, I believe, in more than 100 countries. And writers around the world work on behalf of each other by lobbying, by trying to keep the works alive, 
by protesting to their governments, to the governments of others. Just today, um, I learned there was a poet and an, an artist in Afghanistan who's been put in prison, many, many writers in prison in Afghanistan. And the world, which was so optimistic in 1990, looking to the US as its model and what they could call on in the UN, the different principles, has just changed. We are no longer the model. And not only that, our actions and some of our laws have been the very um, argument that um, some tyrannical governments are using, anti-terror laws and other, to, to imprison their writers. So it's sad. And, and unfortunately, in that time, many, many countries, Afghanistan just had a very vibrant center with writers from all the different um, ethnic groups, women and men. Uh, Myanmar had a very dynamic center. Um, Nicaragua, all of these centers have had to close and pin because the governments have just closed down. And though the U.S. is very active, um, Penn Center here, on their behalf to raise these cases at the United Nations and another forum, um, we, we don't have the same moral authority we used to. And that takes us to where we are today. So Sarah's going to say a little bit about that, and then we'll have a conversation. Great. Thanks a lot, Joanne. Uh, the United States has a somewhat rocky history in terms of freedom of speech. As A.J. Liebling said, the press is free to someone who owns one. But we, we, we seem to blow hot and cold on, on the speech that, that we will tolerate. And in the 1920s, I'm just reading Adam Hochschild's American Midnight which details in, in somewhat appalling ways the, uh, the ways in which speech of all kinds was heavily sat on if it opposed, say, mining interests, oil interests, or, or arms interests. We've moved away from that, I think, partly thanks to Penn, partly thanks to the establishment of the ACLU and other Bill of Rights Organiza supporting organizations. There are now advocates that they may not be able to completely balance or counterbalance the, the power that is out there to try to make only certain kinds of speech acceptable. But there now are, are avenues to follow to, to fight for speech that just didn't exist a century ago. However, today, we seem to be fighting on a book by book basis, a title by title, a county by county basis. 32 states have at least one county where schools are banning books, taking books from shelves, and not with community support, but just in response to some very well vocalized uh, organizations, the, the most prominent of which is Moms for Liberty, which has over 300 chapters. Uh, you can sign up if you go to their website, and all you have to do is present a title that you think does not belong in a school library or in a public library, and they will fight to make sure that that book is taken away. Right now, my favorite band titles that uh, the state of Florida, which has been the most aggressive in banning books, um, my favorite band title in Florida is My Butt is So Noisy followed by, I need a new butt. <laughs> <laughs> My personal favorite band book is Entango Makes Three, which is just a charming picture book that shows, uh, it's a true story, two homosexual penguins who find an abandoned egg in the Central Park Zoo, nurture it, do all the things that hetero penguins do, turning it, feeding each other, and, they hatch the egg and they raise this into a wonderful heterosexual penguin. This book roused so much wrath that it made me think that what the zoo should have done is just fried that egg and served it to <laughs> visitors to the zoo. But joking aside, we're seeing more and more efforts to not just to ban books, but actually to shut down libraries. In the town of Jamestown, Michigan, for instance, they are shuttering the library because the library refused to take off the list of books that, that the library board wanted removed, most of which dealt with queer or transgender uh, topics. The same thing happened in Florida, and uh, in Llano County, Florida, actually a local citizens group, and this is something that Joanne is going to speak about a lot, or knows a lot about anyway. A local citizens group is actually taking the county library board to court 
but this is a this is a very labor intensive one at a time effort and so some of the things that that Joanne is talking about that international pen does on behalf of prisoners of conscience are things that we can translate to try to start having some impact on uh, some of these very repressive attitudes towards books. Just to give you a few numbers, um, through April of 2023, according to uh, Penn, uh, Penn America, 2,253 books have been removed from school library shelves. According to the American Library Association, 1,600 books have been challenged and removed from public library shelves. Writers are starting to self-censor, uh, and, it, it, and it can run the gamut. I think many of you probably know that Elizabeth Gilbert pulled her own novel from publication because she was hearing protests from Ukrainian readers against her setting a novel in Siberia. So whatever side the criticism is coming from, it's having a very chilling effect on speech. And I'm grateful to all of you for coming out tonight because you share Joanne's and my passion for the written word and for free expression. Yeah. Well, one, of, one of the book titles that I, I found sort of stunning that was banned is called Hop on Pop. How many of you have read Hop on Pop to your children? <laughs> Hop on Pop, according to the little blurb underneath it, is banned for abusive behavior toward fathers. <laughs> So the, 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 the important idea, or the, the important commitment is to the, individual, um, the individual's right to think, to write, to consider ideas, and not to be punished for them. Uh, America is in a very precarious place right now, that, but as I tell people, when they compare us to some of the places around the world, at the moment, at least, we are not putting writers in prison. Once you see writers start being put in prison, then you know we have gone down the very slippery slope because that, that begins the turn to real authoritarianism. And as you, as you watch countries around the world, um, you'll see that the early, some of the early people put in prison are the writers because, of course, the writers are speaking the ideas, and they're often ideas that the one person doesn't like who's heading a government. Um, but the, the good news is, that, and what always gave me sort of lifted my spirits with very depressing reading. I, when I, for four years, I headed up International Pan's human rights work around the world. And before I took on that job, I was reading everything to get, just to get up to speed. And there were so many depressing stories of torture and just um, repression of ideas. But what always lifted my spirits and gave me hope is all the citizens and all the writers that were willing to work on behalf of people they didn't even know, but they saw the importance of it. And that was a real force. That was a, it was a global force. And in the US, it's a domestic force, because the individual citizen really is where the, the power is. And certainly in our country, we, we still have that voice. So however one does it, there you know everybody has jobs in their own work. But even just buying somebody's banned book reading it, talking about it, getting the voice of the writer out there who others say you can't listen to is important. And each person will find their own way of, of coming to terms with it. But, you know, societies change because of their citizens. And um, I think, you know, American citizens, we have a very deep tradition of freedom of expression. We have, it, ours is even deeper than um, certain places in Europe that would ban certain things in the U.S. because of our um, Constitution, Bill of Rights, ha has pretty open boundaries. So as those try to close down, I think there's a lot of good history to keep them open and press them open. Yes, and you know, just as Joanne said, buying books, reading books, is, may not, it may seem like a self-indulgent pleasure, but it actually, it, it creates a force in the marketplace. It lets publishers know, uh, and publishers are more than ever uh, responsive to the bottom line rather than to, to the value maybe of what they're publishing. So it lets them know yeah. that, that the market is there and citizens want to read this book. Um, I could talk a lot about that because I'm very biased about some of the ways that books are sold, but I won't, I'll, I'll leave that go. Buy a man book. <laughs> <laughs> In any form, electronic, <laughs> audio. 
Yeah. Also, never be embarrassed to say to a writer, I'm sorry, I don't buy your books, I check them out of the library. Because unless you're Stephen King or you know, Karen Slaughter selling millions of copies of books, for most of us, libraries represent over 40% of our sales. And if you stop checking books out of the library, we're going to disappear. So maybe we should say read a banned book. You don't right. have to necessarily <laughs> buy the banned book. That's right. Just don't do like Abby Hoffman and steal the book. Yeah, don't. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, maybe we should open it up for any questions and yeah. see if the audience wants to or questions or statements in this case. Carrie, what do you think? Um, well, I have a microphone right here, and I'm going to start with a question from me. And then anybody who wants to just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over to you. Um, but my question is, um, you, you have a brand new novel out, you have one that will come out in April. Um, does any of this affect you personally or have you felt the effect weigh on you? Past or present? Sarah, you wanna go first? Uh, I, I would say in the past, uh, early in my career, my my third novel, or four, and I can't remember, um, my, I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for reproductive rights. It's kind of my core issue next to free speech and, and these important, valuable things. And I had a scene in my third novel that dealt with abortion, and my publishers were terrified that they were uh, boycott, that they were going to have boycotts of not just books that they were publishing, but magazines and so on that came out under their imprint. And I, to my shame, I, I let myself be bullied out of that, that chapter. And then the next book, I was so angry with myself that I wrote the whole book around abortion. So, <laughs> um, uh, my most, the book that I'm publishing this coming spring actually deals um, it deals kind of front and center with, with some of the history that, that we've kind of turned a blind eye to. I grew up in Kansas, and my family moved there right around the, the, uh, and the centennial of the founding of the town of Lawrence, Kansas. Kansas came into the Union as a free state. It was kind of one of the big triggers for the actual start of the Civil War. Uh, and we were so proud of ourselves. We were a free state, and we girls acted out the, the anti-slavery women bringing smuggling uh, bullets in the hems of our crinolines past the slavery forces that controlled access into Kansas territory. And it was only later that I learned, number one, free state did not mean you were anti-slavery. It just meant you didn't want slavery in your state. But even more profound than that, after the Civil War, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, the abolitionists then began forcibly and violently seizing land from African Americans who had settled in the town and from indigenous peoples who had helped the Union win the war. So my book has that backstory. It's, it's been a very painful story to confront. And as I was researching it, I began to feel like I could really get on board with Ron DeSantis because I thought, this is just painful. I don't want to know all these hard, ugly <laughs> facts. Um, but, um, but you knew better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, Carrie, I, I have sort of a, a, a mixed answer for that. The next book coming out is called The Far Side of the Desert, and it, it, it's... <laughs> It begins in Santiago de Compostela, Spain, and it moves to the Sahara, and it's in Morocco and Gibraltar and London and Washington. So it's in lots of different places. And it's, it, it's not about different religions, but it does have different cultures within it. And I I'm, I'm very, uh, was very aware in the writing of it of the perception of um, an American me writing about all of this. And so I needed to be very clear that I knew what I was writing about. And I don't know what the reception will be, but um, the challenge for some of this censorship and especially self-censorship is the culture that will try to cancel somebody writing about something that isn't their experience. And, and that to me is insidious as censorship. Yes, exactly. It, when a writer is told they're not allowed to write about this because you're not that, 
Oh, well, that's what writing is about. It's trying to imagine, it's trying to have empathy. Now to do it badly, to not research it, to do it from prejudice or anything else is, is not good, but even that shouldn't be censored. You can just say, this is a really not a very good writer. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. read them. But I, I think that, that censorship on writers that we're only allowed to write about our own experience, well then how do we broaden our own world and how do we help broaden the world of others? And I, I think that's very, that's very important. So that's been on my, that's been on my mind. And my, my first, my very first writing was um, dealt with civil rights, a lot of, you know, a lot of civil rights. It, it's done well. And in fact, one of my stories is in a collection called Short Stories of the Civil Rights Movement, which has, I think, 11 white writers and 13 African American writers. So I said, okay, well, I got, I got through that. Oh, I'd love to get that. Yeah. <laughs> What's it called? Um, Short Stories of the Civil Rights Movement. And it's essentially talk, it essentially has fiction writers writing about the civil rights movement, but through fiction. Mine, mine, it was called The Beginning of Violence, and it related to the Nashville sit-ins. But it has some, you know, it has wonderful, you know, wonderful writers in it. It's Alice Walker and I think Baldwin and some, some good ones, Roselle and Brown. It, it, it was fun. It was, a, it was a real privilege to be in that. But, but these, are, these are questions that writers have as you're trying to be true to the story you're trying to tell. But you, you don't, you, you want that story to be as broad as you can make it but still have verisimilitude. And, and I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I know that is a pressure. Penn International, in the two, two years ago, maybe it was three years ago, did put out actually what they called a manifesto of the imagination, defending the right of writers to be able to imagine. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, that's important. We need to stand up for that too. I have a quick question. Are, are there writers, other writers in the audience tonight? I, I have never had a book ban, but I'm wondering if anyone here has had that experience. Yeah. Well, they used to say if you banned the book in South Africa, it would do great sales. So <laughs> <laughs> That was back in our early, earlier, earlier days. I, just, I sometimes think, what do I have to do to get banned? <laughs> Talk to Ron, De, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> do you have sympathy for it? Hi. Yes. Great conversation. Uh, when talking to writers from other parts of the world, it seems like the legacy of censorship they're dealing with has to deal with state power. Yeah. The government's banning them and uh, they're trying to figure out how to subvert the, that ban. While, uh, and always, it seemed like uh, they always envied the United States and in terms of freedom of expression that there is over here. But now it looks like in the United States, it's not censorship is not so much about state power, as, uh, as it is about uh, not alienating these micro constituencies. It's almost like a marketing decision. Mm -hmm. And how do you subvert that? I'm at a loss about that. I don't think the marketing decision is, I think the marketing decision is quite, it is a challenge, but there is state power now. And, and that's what's really challenging is because the states, the governments are the ones doing the banning. And that's for the first time in a large, well, I think we've had it before, but we haven't had it to Not this level. This scale. Not at this scale. So the state actually is getting involved in trying to tell their citizens what they can read and think and, you know, put in schools. The schools are often a state institution. So, and I'm sure there's a way to balance that out. But, but you're right, the other, a lot around the world, it's the state that has had the power to, to ban to put in prison, to execute even. One of the, one of the writers, um, a very admirable man named Lu Xiaoboa, who was the um, first Chinese citizen to win the Nobel Prize for Peace. And he was a writer and um, he was articulated something called Charter 08 along with other independent Chinese writers about democracy, bringing democracy to China. And he was put in prison and he was in prison for 11 years before he died um, in custody, and they never planned to let him out. And, and he helped found the Independent Chinese Pen Center. And I had the pleasure of <clears throat> being the International Secretary of Pen when he was president of that center. And though we actually never met in person because I got to Hong Kong, but he wasn't allowed to be in Hong Kong, and I didn't get to mainland China until after he was in prison. Um, but I knew many of his colleagues and friends, and the really remarkably courageous and articulate Chinese writers who want democracy in China. And they did a big collection of essays about him in Chinese history, and they asked me to edit the English language version. 
and it was just really a, a great pleasure. And he, he's one of the pinnacles. He was at Tiananmen Square, and he just spent his life articulating. He's very smart, and he was a very good writer, and the Chinese government, interestingly, really feared him for that reason. Um, but that was state power. I mean, that was brutal state power. I had the privilege of being one of two North American writers, along with Margaret Atwood, invited to speak in Japan on the 75th anniversary of Penn Japan. And that organization, or that chapter, was founded in 1935, when Japan was really flexing its imperial muscle on the Pacific Rim. And the writers who joined Penn, like the Charter 08 writers in China, uh, they were in prison during the war, they were tortured, they were murdered, but they, they persevered. And out of that perseverance came um, actually the anti-nuclear movement. And it started like this, as kitchen table conversations among women uh, who's, uh, who were reacting to the nuclear tests in the Pacific and uh, seeing what was happening to uh, th this. It didn't actually come directly out of the bombing of, of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It came out of the, the cancers that were developing rapidly among Japanese fishermen who were caught in the radioactive fallout in the Pacific tests. So these women would get together and, and begin writing letters together at their kitchen tables. They were kitchen. That, that's what they called themselves, the kitchen table writers. Um, and they couldn't get any traction. Japan was still considered, you know, persona non grata on the international stage. We're talking the early 1950s. And so they actually wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, and um, she began publishing the letters that these women were composing in her weekly column in the Herald Tribune. and. It caught fire with people, really women, all around the globe. And so uh, starting in Western Europe, they, they picked it up, and the movement finally came to the States. And then we began having test ban treaties. So this isn't exactly on topic of censorship and book banning, but it does show that if you really have a passionate engagement in an issue, you can start a revolution at your kitchen table. And often it is the, the women, I, I must say, you know, in, in Argentina and many places, who because, because the men have been the one taken off, sons have been killed, and, you know, the, the, the disappeared. Um, there, there are certainly women in the case lists of Penn that have been disappeared, killed, attacked, but the, the, the larger number are men, so it's the women speaking up on that. And I just always wonder myself if I would have the courage that some of these writers have had. I, I actually, I hope I never actually am put to the test because I don't want to show that I'm as craven <laughs> as I fear I might be. But uh, well, we know your we know your detective would have that. Courage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Juan Lopez. A uh, great com conversation and great segue into my question and the mar uh, and it has to 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 do with marketing. So um, I was curious. I don't I I don't know if you're still involved with. Um, Penn, but what is Penn U.S. doing uh, to <laughs> help educate consumers? This is all about um, education, right? What you said earlier um, about read a banned book. Um, we talk about this in this room, but it we don't. People, the rest of the of, of our population is not hearing that. Um, have you? If you do, if you know anything about it, if Penn U.S. has tried to work with media companies, um, all of all kinds, local, regional, in, in, uh, national, uh, to get them to help promote this idea, um, to help educate the consumer to do more and to be more engaged and involved. I um, was the publisher of a national healthcare media company. If someone came to me and asked me to run PSAs about this, I would run PSAs about mm -hmm. that. Thanks, that's such a great question. Can you speak to? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> a, 
a number of things that Penn, Penn is doing. And, and also I will say that Penn works in concert with a number of organizations, a number of literary organizations who have this on their radar. And um, so th there's a whole group of them, the Authors Guild, Poets and Writers, and all of whom have a different take on it and a different constituency. But Penn in many ways does l sort of lead the charge on, on censorship. And one, one of the important things they do at a governmental level is, you know, they go and they speak to Congress, they um, try to lobby state by state by state to help, un, you know, get rid of these laws, to protest these laws. Um, they are in touch with publishers. I don't know what the conversation is in terms of um, specific acts the publishers are taking, but they're definitely in conversations with those publishers. And then regularly they put out a newsletter for, for their members. Um, but it is a membership organization, though it's broadened its membership um, along those lines. But it definitely works with its members to keep them informed, and then to work state by state. But it, you know, is a lot more than can be that can be done, and um, it can only lead part of the charge. I don't know. I, I think the more people getting involved, probably the better. But I think it's it. You know, it's a, one of my frustrations too. Is how how do we start organizing and getting the word out to people who, who potentially would be organized? One of the frustrations, I think, of, of people who care passionately about these issues is to find out that 70% of elections for school boards and library boards are uncontested. And this is where uh, people who are, are pro-censorship and um, pro, uh, well, whitewashing U.S. history, to put it in the bluntest terms. Uh, this is where they're getting their, their local power and passing these regulations. And so how we start fighting back at a, at a grassroots level is the most urgent question that we have. And I don't have an answer for that, but um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? Penguin Random House is suing Florida over the book bannings. I love that. Also, I'm, I'm told some publishers were no longer selling their books into Tennessee because of some of the laws that had been brought down. And that's very sad to think about. But it's just too, too, you know, too problematic. So I don't know if they'll start suing Tennessee. But it, I, in my lifetime, I don't ever remember we've been in a place where the states are all at odds with, with each other. And the governors aren't talking and resolving, but tend to be lining up in different corridors. Jane. The comment, if you didn't hear it in the back, was the importance of studying all candidates for office and voting in those elections. You know, we tend not, we tend to look at the top of the ballot and ignore the stuff at the bottom as not, we don't pay attention to it. We have some very strange judges in Cook County um, because nobody's paying attention to what they're doing in court. So yeah, we need to be more active. And how do we make that happen? I don't know, but I'm going to figure something out, put on my armor, get on my aging horse and gallop back to relieve the siege of Orleans. Uh, again, thank you for coming tonight. We all really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you think about what's going on in all, many of the major universities where authors and speakers are being banned. Um, the, the question had to do with what's happening in many universities where um, essentially mob rule is determining who gets to speak. and. Um, it's it's very troubling no matter where the speakers being silenced are on the on the political spectrum or what views they're holding it's kind of outside my brief yeah. to work on that but i think that university administrations have been sort of asleep at the switch and not started getting together and having serious policy decisions and making those clear throughout the university that this kind of mob rule it won't be tolerated at the university. Yeah. But I, I don't know if there's another approach. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's very problematic from the left or the right or wherever if you can't have a free exchange of ideas. But it, we, we also, it bumps us up against how we deal with 
um, outright disinformation and um, you know lying that goes on and who's the arbiter of that and I think both at, at, at universities and certainly in the news media we're, we're hitting that a lot and so you know where does censorship and truth and disinformation I mean that's a that's a, a real tension that um, there's not an easy answer for w within and I keep coming back to the context of Penn because that's where I have the most experience um, Penn has a charter and, and it's this charter that <clears throat> that has brought together these you know more than a hundred and fifty centers around the world and if you think of anything that uh, <clears throat> that all these different nationalities and all could agree on that's pretty hard to imagine so this is obviously a charter not of politics but of principles and the principles are the principle of free expression, the principle to respect those that aren't like you, the, the principle of, um, <clears throat> of having truth and factual information. But sometimes these clash because the principle of respecting the other and the principle of free expression sometimes bump, in, bump against each other. Uh, a, a couple of decades ago, I guess, you know, I don't know if you recall the controversy over the Danish cartoons that were published. Well, Penn was right in the throes of that because it was a, a Penn Center right there. And I happened to be international secretary at the time. And and a lot of these ideas we had to think through. And essentially, um, the place that I came to is in a democracy and in a free society, you, you realize that everything isn't just one way or the other, but you're, you, you can accommodate um, I don't know if I want to say conflicting ideas, but ideas that bump against each other and we we allow that we accommodate that you know we accommodate ideas that we don't all agree with and we figure out how to live with those but on top of on top of those bumping principles um, I think is the principle of free expression you have to be able to express yourself freely and then the other person has the absolute right to push back against you and say no that's wrong and you have a, a discussion going on but uh, it's important to have that exchange of ideas but there's always the dark side of that, and, th and that has to do with, I mean, I think particularly, I, I guess, uh, out of personal experience of, of anti-Semitism, yep. the lies that are constantly told about Jews, is that something that we tolerate because that's free expression? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think also, in, in just in terms of the discussion that at least I've been involved with it. When Penn, every time a case comes in, we evaluate, is this a case? Should this be a case? If you have something like anti-Semitism or the denial of the Holocaust or any of those and somebody's going to be put in prison, when, when is it a case? When is it not a case? Well, one, it can't be violent. If violence is involved, you know, we don't handle it. If the person saying nefarious um, things is just a poet who's saying things you don't like, then that's one thing. If it's a state, somebody who has the power to actually do something about it, then that's a whole other case. So, you know, none of, none of us like that the anti-Semitism, the, the racism or anything, but if it's a, a writer writing and a poet saying it, then um, there's civil recourse. But the idea of putting people in prison for it is, is, is a challenge. But I also find in Europe, because of the history of Europe, there different and more rigorous standards than in the United States where we have you know the second amendment so these are not these are not easy questions the but but an important first question first amendment I think. first amendment I'm sorry the first amendment not the second amendment the second amendment the second amendment is you have guns you have guns yes we don't want the second amendment but the first amendment but um but the important element is where is, where is the state involved and you know who has the power